it is a really arduous process making movies and you really give a lot of yourself and a lot of your time and focus and energy. I don't believe in doing movies that are easily forgettable. I don't want to do uh, films that people don't care about. I'm from LA. I grew up on Hollywood and Western. I, my parents both came from New York and they had this postcard image of utopian Los Angeles and Hollywood and then we kind of moved into the mecca of prostitution and drug addicts. So that's where I grew up. It was, it was a pretty hardcore neighborhood and I think that gave me a lot of motivation to sort of be successful really and try to do something else. I grew up in a, an artistic household. I was always kind of imitating my dad's friends and I would imitate everyone around us in the neighborhood. I do that, carry that over in school and get into a lot of trouble constantly. My favorite class was drama class in, in high school. I was, you know, it was the only thing I did exceedingly well in. Everything else I was pretty mediocre in, except for biology, I was pretty good in that. But I never had sort of formal training. Once I found out that people actually got paid for this, I was like, let's, let's go for it. The first film that I remember seeing was uh, the black and white original King Kong with my dad downtown and bursting into tears and falling in love with movies at that point. But when I got to become an actor, it was watching that very vulnerable James Dean in East of Eden who just blew me away. Cow! I knew of people, you know, that were in the industry. I just didn't know how to get into it. If it weren't for the fact that I had a mother that really took the time to listen to a kid that said, I, I want to do this for a living. This is what I know I want to do. This is my passion. Uh, you know, a 10, 11 year old kid. If it hadn't been for her taking me to auditions in the sheer proximity of being able to drive to the valley or drive to, you know, Hollywood on the way back from school, I probably wouldn't be doing this for a living. You know, if I lived in any other location, I don't think my dream would have been a possibility. I remember going to different agents when I was nine or 10 years old. I got rejected a couple times, and then I just kept asking and asking and asking. I remember my dad saying, just stick with it. Someday you'll have your day. And, I, and then I, I came back, I think, two years later and finally got an agent. And the auditioning process at a young age was kind of cutthroat. I met one of my best friends, Toby McGuire, at an audition. And you know, there's this whole dynamic with mothers there and like, what kid is doing what? She said to Toby, and I was just doing karate kicks over at him and like having a good time. She's like, watch out for that kid, he's trying to psych you out. The kid, it was mind games. And I was like, I was just having fun. But it was this very competitive environment for kids. Yeah, I was on TV at about three years old. Have you ever seen Romper Room, that television Are you kidding? Try and keep me away from Romper Room. Well, it was my favorite show at the time, and I, I just absolutely loved the show, and I used to sing the songs at home and everything. They had a little circle, and they were all singing and dancing and stuff like that, but I was too excited to be on camera, so I was running up and slapping the cameras and stuff like that, and screaming and looking inside the camera. I tried to pull my mom on stage, and finally I was too much to handle, so they completely kicked me off You were the 86. Show. You were tossed. You were adios. I was adios. And were you, were you crestfallen? You must have been crushed when you got bounced off No, room. no, no. I was really? I, I saw myself on television. I was just like You went crazy. Yeah, neurotic. It was beautiful. I <laughs> got a commercial for Matchbox Cars where I played a little gangster and opened a Matchbox set and raced this other kid. And uh, I couldn't believe I got that job. When I first started like getting into commercials, everyone came up, Hey, you're the keeps it popping kid, huh? And I'm like, Yeah, that's probably my most famous commercial. This is a chunk of super soft bubble yell bubblegum. This is a loud thumping tune pumping boom box. Both are known for blast. Put on the yum is the fun that never blows out. Big mouth busting bubble yum. Keeps it popping. Hey, come on. Hi, honey. How was school? Okay. Hey, hey Mom. Do you think I can get some new clothes? Any special reason? It's just a dumb school dance. Come on. No way. Hi. Want to dance? Sure. I like your sweater. Why, you just showed us one of the most important safety tips of all. 
I did? Affirmative, little buddy. Cars often come in and out of driveways very quickly, so be alert at all times. Know what is going on around you, and you'll always be street safe and street smart. Ooh, I love saying that. Ow! Play it again, Alex! The street safe, the street smart. Next Saturday, their last chance to make the state finals. I know. Wait a minute. Our team's got the hottest rider. And we've got the hottest bike. What do you mean, we? The Glen Ridge Riders are a team. Right, Kyle? Right. It's a combination of being in the right place at the right time and being prepared for it and sticking with it. I actually got a television show uh, halfway through my senior year. That was Growing Pains. Luke! Uh, Mr. Seaver, um, I'm looking for a new French book. I've got an outdated one. Let's see, uh, here's the right book. Now I can learn. No, 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 never mind the book. Uh, why don't you go ahead and explain this bed to me? Oh, someone must be sleeping in there! <laughs> I suppose it would be not a common occurrence, I mean, taking some homeless stranger into your house, but you know, this is TV, but I'm sure that does happen a lot, and I'm just happy that it happened to me on the show. They foresaw that it was probably the last season, and I had three or four, three or four episodes, and I didn't know, you know, contractually they didn't need to let me out to go uh, do this movie, but you know, thanks to the support of the cast and everyone that who was so lovely, they, they kind of lobbied for me to be able to go do this movie. And so they wrote me out of the season. I got to go do this boy's life. Here I am, you lucky people. Do what? People can call me anything they want as long as they don't call me late for supper. <laughs> <laughs> what a dope. It's just not that often that you get a starring role above Robert De Niro in this incredible screenplay and was, you know, Ellen Barkin and Michael Caton Jones and it was just, everyone was sort of fiending for this role. I got down, I suppose, to the final five and there was a last day, Toby was there and I do remember thinking to myself, I gotta do something to stand out. In the audition there was Art Linson, Michael Caton Jones, Art Linson was, was the producer, and De Niro. And I remember it was a mustard jar scene. He had to jam a mustard jar in my eye re re repeatedly. It was a, an abuse scene. The script sort of didn't call for it, but I s got up and I, he said, now is it empty, is it empty? And I got up and I screamed, no! Like com completely unnecessary. And I sat there <laughs> with my head looking like a red tomato and everyone started laughing. And then Bob, a traditional De Niro fashion, kind of just looked at me and went, good, it's good. Prep school fucker, is it empty? <laughs> Is it empty? Huh? No. Good. All right. Now clean it out. We made a vow, Toby and I, we said, whoever gets the lead, we gotta fight for one of us to get a role in this movie. So that was my one request, that Toby got a, a role in the movie, and he has a small role in the film, too. I'm the most nostalgic hey. about that movie, and I remember every single day on Anybody set home? because everything was so new to me. Mom said you were sick. Having come from a sitcom where everything was very yeah. relaxed on set, joking That's around, to sweet. having, you know, De Niro walk on set. Four the sort of hours. dynamic the presence thing? that he had. And then I saw him go Good. through his process, the, the improv. Just the oh, technical work the was something that I witnessed every yeah, single day. Yeah. Really blew me away because I didn't know how to conduct myself on a set. I was just sort of a, a wild animal, and it was really Michael Caton Jones that gave me some of these incredible fundamentals about making a movie. You know, every time I would get tired of a scene or not want to uh, persist, he'd go, "Paint is temporary, film is forever." I mean, I really learned everything about making movies from that one experience. <laughs> just about got dry gulch, Mister. I actually had dinner with De Niro recently and he told me I was the one who said you should get the job, which was very sweet. He is my favorite actor of all time, he really is. That relationship with him and Scorsese just influenced every one of my friends in, in the industry that I've met through the years. That is the golden relationship of cinema to me. I mean, it just gets no better than that. That run of films that they did together is just, can't even talk about it, it's, it's that mind-blowing. Well, who the hell else are you talking? Are you talking to me? He was the actor I watched as a young man obsessed with films 
At 13 years old, my father took me out to the movies one afternoon to see Midnight Run. And as the lights went down, he turned to me and said, if you really want to be an actor and get into this profession, if you want to understand what great acting is, you watch that man on screen. There was this one role that I wanted to play desperately, but I started to get offers from, for other movies, and uh, there was a big Disney movie they wanted me to do, and I don't know where I got those little balls at 16 years old to say, no, I'm going to wait it out because I want to audition for this other film. But if there's one thing that I'm really proud of in my entire career, it's that moment to say that and have that conviction of what I wanted to do. <laughs> Doctor said we'd be lucky if Arnie lived to be 10. I could go at any time. Arnie, don't be rude. Some days you want him to live. <laughs> I kill him, Gilbert. I know, buddy. Okay, son, come down now. Bye! Some days you don't. When is this gonna stop? This was really the first distinct character that I was playing, so I tried to emulate, I suppose, what I saw Bob do <laughs> on set. And I said, well, I'm, I'm going to go to a home in, in, in Austin, Texas and spend some time with some kids who have mental disabilities. And I spent about a week there. I remember the first day being incredibly nervous and we did a lot of takes. But the more I was on set, the more I got used to the atmosphere, got my feet into the role. It just sort of took on a life of its own. Hmm? So you're Gilbert. Because I'm Gilbert. Because nobody hurts Arnie, right? That role was so fun because I wasn't dependent on the screenplay whatsoever. I mean, I had my own set of rules. I could do whatever the hell I wanted. Sometimes it was like a dramatic scene for Johnny and I would just be throwing spaghetti and they'd say, you sure you want to do that? I'm like, I don't know, this is what I would be doing. And they'd say, go for it. It was incredibly freeing because you paid attention to the script, but it was so incredibly loose and so improvisational. And I really just lived in my own world. And it was great, it was awesome. My father would always sort of steer me towards interesting projects. You know, for example, doing, playing Arthur Rimbaud was never something that was on my radar. And my dad sort of, uh, he's an incredibly well-read person. And he's like, look, you know, I know you're getting offered these other things, but take a look at this guy, Arthur Rimbaud. He was kind of the James Dean of his era. He was a very radical poet, changed poetry at that time. And, you know, I'm not telling you what to do, but just, you know, you might want to take a look at this. Don't expect me to be faithful to you. Mm. Why are you so harsh with me? Because you need it. <laughs> damn, you are fast. Did you even see me? I was so damn fast. Woo! Oh. <laughs> hey there, Mr. Swedish Champion. Are you done? Stay down now, unless you're still fighting. Yes, I give up. Get the winner! <laughs> Not fast, but Sweden just a very small place. <laughs> Tell me now. I think I was 18 when I did Basketball Diaries, because I was in New York for the first time in my own apartment. That was a role that I really fought for and really wanted, and it was incredibly low budget. That was another role that I was really, really passionate about. I played Jim Carroll, and he, throughout the book, He's constantly writing in his journal and he's keeping an account of his life and what's going on around him. Did I ever tell you about the first time I did heroin? It was in a diary form, you know what I mean? Jim Carroll wrote this, you know, pieces at a time, so we had to like compile it all into one sort of storyline, so we had to like change things around, but I think it, it definitely captures the drug aspect of the book. <laughs> I read his, his poetry and his book, and I remember talking to my, my parents about New York at that time, and I just thought it was so beautifully written. When I really, you know, read Romeo and Juliet for real and really understood what was going on, it was something so timeless that defied the time and character Romeo was, was like one of the earliest rebels. He rebelled against his entire family for love, you know, and I thought that was a profound thing. Once I started to get into it and I realized what sort of a ballsy guy he was by, by marrying Juliet and like saying no to his family and all his friends and everything just for this girl and he sort of risked his own life for it and it was a great character. 
Why then, O oh brawling love, O oh loving hate, O oh anything of nothing first create? What I didn't want to do was have that perfect way of speaking Shakespeare, you know what I mean? I didn't want to make every syllable sound beautiful and have it all rhyme and coincide in a sort of beautiful I way. I wanted to make it more like conversation. Oh, wilt thou leave me so unsatisfied? What satisfaction canst thou have tonight? The exchange of thy love's faithful vow for mine. I gave thee mine before that stood requested! Claire just came in and was just so in the moment and so there and so not trying to do this like little angelic flower Juliet, you know, like with the hand movements and everything so precise and you know. When we were doing the scene or we were, you know, supposed to be together, she came right up to me, looked me right in the eye and just started doing lines, you know what I mean, without conscience as, as far as how she should be and she was just pure and there and great. The emotional aspect of him was pretty hard, I mean, he is truly upset throughout the whole second half of the movie. I mean, he's in, in a rage. His whole world is destroyed, so doing that much is certainly, it takes a toll on you. You gotta make sure that you're keeping yourself healthy if you, if you wanna do it that much, because you, you seriously get sick a lot. <laughs> I defy you, stars! <laughs> Baz is such an interesting, dynamic force and so enthusiastic about creating art and, and experimenting that you sit alone with him for, you know, an hour and you just want to do anything that he says. It's amazing. I mean, he's, he's, he's incredible. He, he's so inspiring. He really is. And he's, he is, uh, and he's a director that takes a lot of chances and, he, and a lot of the stuff is incredibly broad but when it comes down to the to the text to the actual words he is he is incredibly precise and persistent about um, you know doing literature justice and with Romeo and Juliet you know he was incredibly precise about it too but at the same time it was this incredibly new journey of trying to modernize the bard which was you know uh, very scary at the time so how come you're visiting me? What do you mean? I don't need a reason to visit. How come you never visited before? I did visit you. You were unconscious. It doesn't count as a visit. How Look, can I that be a visit if I didn't know you were here, Mom? When you're unconscious, all I can do is make the effort. Your Aunt Bessie down in Florida has leukemia. She's not doing so well. It's a possibility she might die. I didn't know I had an Aunt Bessie. She's been to the house. When? Right after your dad and I got married. Mom, I wasn't born yet. He catches bugs and he puts them on like this little leash. A leash? Yeah, it's a hair leash. He takes out a strand of his hair, he ties it around the bug. The other end he tacks down under his bunks. One time, like he had this whole zoo of bugs walking around little circles all over the place. Hank. My friend, he grabbed the back of his cafeteria tray. He smashed them all! <laughs> that was funny. That was funny. Why are you making up these stories? Do you want to go to a real party? It didn't initially appeal to me because I think I took a long time to get my mind around doing a film of that nature. But it was really my conversations with Kate Winslet, who's been a lifelong friend since doing that movie, and her passion about the project, and then meeting Jim after that. and. It was an experiment to try to do something that was this incredible epic. It was a mind-blowing, insane, thrilling experience for the both of us. It really was, uh, it was unlike any other experience I've ever had. I'm the king of the world! <laughs> this character for me was a sort of open-hearted, uh, free-spirited, bohemian type and it was a lot more difficult than ever thought it would be to play somebody that didn't have many internal demons or personal angst to fall back on. I almost had to be like an open book, which was really hard. When you're sitting there running towards the back of a ship with, you know, 2,000 people around you screaming for their lives on a ship that looks exactly like the Titanic, and while it's like going up in the air on hydraulics, you can't help but feel like you're really there. God almighty. Kate, she's such a terrific person in general that our chemistry sort of just naturally happened I think on screen. We, we 
just like each other as a people. I think that definitely showed. such a committed actress and I saw that at Cabo Uri 22 something like that she was so committed and focused and amazing and worked so hard on that movie and the movie went over by many many months and it was an incredibly hard experience for both of us to do but it was rewarding at the same time we got to act alongside each other in a film that I think touched a lot of people around the world and I'm very proud of the movie you're not you didn't come as a couple tonight did you yeah we came together did you really Absolutely. Yeah. Very cool. I didn't at all grasp how far reaching this movie was. People would say to me, you know, this movie's doing really well. I'm like, great, that's wonderful. And they're like, no, no, really, really, really well. Great, so what does that mean? I mean, I didn't understand box office statistics or how many people were going to repeatedly see this movie, Teenage Girls, and it just became this, this thing, you know? I, I, don't, I don't really know how to describe it. It was really Jim's writing and his story and that romance and those lovers that basically at the end of the film don't get to be together. A lot of tears for people at the end of that movie. Why did you do that? Why? You jump high, jump right. All right. It's probably a lot worse nowadays for people who are sort of pushed into the limelight like that because of the media and the intense sort of scrutiny of the internet and all that. But even at that time for me, you know, I was nowhere to, nowhere to sort of run to. <laughs> I wanted to say, okay, I want to let everything calm down, let the dust settle from this movie, regroup and go find a project that I'm really, really passionate about. So I didn't work for a while. But at that time, I was when I really said to myself, okay, you know, here I am with this incredible opportunity. What am I going to do with it? You know, people dream about being in the position where they can finance a film based on their name. And I said to myself, all right, uh, let's go back to the drawing board, so to speak. And now you can make movies that you want. And not that Titanic wasn't something that I wanted to do, but you can really be in control of your career like never before. You can develop things and, and seek things out that are interesting to you and pursue them and, and get them financed. And you take the side of traitors. Of this one. Worst of all, my own brother who's trying to do this to me! And what have you done to him? I remember seeing Train Spotting in Cannes, and Danny Boyle's work was just incredibly punk rock, that movie. They offered me the film for the beach, and I wanted to work with them really, really bad. Really, really bad. You wanna drink snake blood? <sighs> I ran into Marty at some sort of after party for a film, and I walked up to him and I was kind of in shock to meet him and I said hi and he goes hi and he was kind of on his way out he's always usually on his way out so <laughs> hi kid hi hi how you doing Bob told me about you I really great job in Gilbert Craig and I saw your other films too I can't even great great to meet you Bob. so I said wow he's seen my work this is incredible wow so that kind of got the clock ticking uh, not clock ticking but my mind thinking maybe I could work with this guy one day so I asked my agent if there was anything that he had in mind for someone in my age range and they researched that in his development, he had been wanting to do this film about, you know, the five points, turn of the century in New York. And it had been a passion project of him, this book, Gangs of New York, that he'd been trying to do for 20 years. And I kept sort of penetrating his representation with mine and saying, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want to do this, I want to do this. And I was eating my pad thai doing uh, the beach. I remember the moment when I got the call that I had my noodles in my hand. He goes, he wants to do the movie with you. And I dropped my pad thai. What do you think you're doing? I'm dancing. I said, why'd you pick me? That's none of your business. Would you mind telling me? We were talking about who was going to play this incredible role of Bill the Butcher. And a few names came up and somebody said, it may have been Marty, who said, what about Daniel? And people immediately said, well, he's retired. He's not, he's a cobbler. It was actually my job to go speak with him. Both of them had worked together previously on Age of Innocence, but he had, he had stopped acting. So Scorsese actually said to me, look, I, I, I'm not sure how Daniel feels, if he's ready to work or not. You know, you're another actor. You should, you know, have a conversation with him and suss it out. And I'll never forget, you know, meeting him in New York. I went to his brownstone, sort of knocked on the door, and, and, he, and he opened the door and he goes, hi, 
hi, how are you? And I go, hi, nice to meet you, Leonardo. Daniel, he goes, should we walk? I go, okay. And he didn't say anything to me for the first couple minutes. So I said, all right, I'm not gonna say anything to him either. Never met one another and just walked. It was incredibly surreal and I just said to myself, I'm gonna wait till he's ready to speak. In the middle of Central Park, he finds a bench and goes, that looks good, would you like to sit? We sat down and we started talking about acting. So I immediately asked him, I said, look, you know, there's the role of a, of a gangster in the turn of the century in New York who's a butcher who carries butcher knives with a top hat and a mustache and a Martin Scorsese movie. Who in their right mind wouldn't want to do this? He said, Leo, you have to understand, it's not about not wanting to work with him on a film like this. Marty is the reason that I became an actor. I saw Mean Streets and that film was so raw and incredible and made me you know, inspired to act. And I don't want to be of disservice to him. I said, well, I'm, I'm sure that we can figure something out. <laughs> Slow sort of conversation that we had. It was actually uh, Toby who said to him, you know, I think it's when somebody has a talent like that, like yours, it's almost their responsibility to do it. I think he slightly disagreed at first, but eventually, thank, thank God he said yes, and I got to work with somebody who was another huge influence on myself as an actor. There's, there's commitment, and then there's Daniel Day-Lewis. You know, his level of commitment is just so absolute, and he goes home in character, but, you know, to a certain degree, I'm sure he has to kiss his child and his wife and go to bed. That kind of level of commitment was inspiring again for me. I mean, he was just phenomenal and in character all the time, and I think as an actor, being able to witness that was another stage of, of learning for me. What'll it be then? Rib or chop? Loin or shank? I'd read the book years ago, I was a huge fan of the book, and I, I knew that they tried to make the movie a couple different times through the years, and it never came together. I was off shooting Gangs in New York, I, I read the script, I thought Jeff Nathanson did an unbelievable job of adapting it into a screenplay, which was very hard to do. Then I, I basically started looking for a director to be involved, and I didn't even think of Mr. Spielberg as an option. I didn't even think that he would be interested in it. I don't think there's been many movies about con artists, and especially a con artist that was 18 years old and probably the biggest bank robber of all time, right after he graduated high school. You know, for an actor, it's about the art of misdirection and how he's able to make somebody, for example, concentrate on the steak dinner as opposed to the phony check that he's about to pass. And I think those are all fantastic elements for an actor to play. Dr. Harris. Yes? Do you concur? Uh, concur with what, sir? I met with Frank, who is quite an interesting person. I've said this before, but you know, you don't think he would steal a postage stamp. You know, he looks as innocent as a school teacher. He looks like the sweetest, most unassuming man you'd ever meet. But uh, he has a way of engaging you with his eye contact, with his energy and his intelligence. I remember him coming to set one day, and the whole crew basically took their own spontaneous lunch, even though we were in the middle of a shot, and started listening to Frank Abagnale talk about all of his cons for half an hour, and all of a sudden Stephen came and was like, what the hell's going on? What are you guys doing? We gotta get back to work. He has that way about him, and I think the most interesting thing about him is that a lot of his way of seducing people was very unconscious. And, and the thing that I brought to the character was his subtlety in the way he sort of switched accents and to make him seem more uh, trustworthy or to make him seem higher up on the totem pole of success. I didn't want to be too perfect because I don't think Frank was. I think he got by on his etiquette, his charm, his personalities, and his ability to misdirect people to think about something else in, in situations rather than how perfect he acted as a lawyer, or as a pilot, or as a doctor. This is irrefutable evidence that the defendant is in fact lying. The Aviator, it was the first film that I had produced, that I had thought of, it was sort of my concept. I read a book on Howard Hughes uh, in my early 20s and I tried to develop that for many, 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 many years. Michael Mann wrote a screenplay and what I was gonna do with Michael Mann. 
he had just done Ollie and said he was bio-picked out. And then I brought it to Marty, and I didn't know if, if he would respond to it, because he'd just done Gangs of New York. And he basically said to me, look, this screenplay is interesting. I picked it up, and I read Aviator on the front title, and I said, well, I don't know anything about aviation. Well, I didn't know anything about boxing, and I did Raging Bull, so I'm, I'm going to consider this. Thankfully, he did it. Oh, I want to get this done right to show me all the blueprints. 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 All the research necessary to know how to react to everything in every scenario. So when you come to set, you're already empowered. He is giving you the ultimate right to try anything at any time, even if that choice is a wrong one. Of course, along the way, he's going to subtly navigate you to the places that he knows that character needs to go for an audience. But it's a really an empowering process when somebody gives you full ownership of the character you're embodying. I get these ideas, these. Uh crazy ideas about uh, <clears throat> things that may not uh, things that may not really be there yeah sometimes I truly fear that I'm losing my mind I met with doctors who specialize in obsessive compulsive disorder and kind of lived with the man for a couple days who had OCD. Met uh, Jane Russell who worked with him and Terry Moore's ex-wife and read everything I could, watched the footage and really had marathon rehearsal periods with John Logan and Martin Scorsese to weave different things in and change stuff around. It was one of the biggest rehearsal preparation periods I've ever had. I was like an investigative journalist it was so much fun to dig into history like that and, and try to encapsulate where he was at, the, at certain time periods in his life and the choices that he made. I put the sweat of my life into this thing. I got my reputation rolled up in it. And I have stated several times that if it's a failure, I'll probably leave this country and never come back if I mean it. I kind of look at his relationship with women the same way he looked at uh, airplanes. I think he had genuine love for them, but he couldn't stick with just one. He was always moving on to the new faster airplane, the bigger turbine jets, the, uh, the sleeker new look, and the same with women. He constantly was changing and uh, couldn't just sit in one cockpit. <laughs> I think uh, he was a man obsessed, quite simply. He had a list of dreams and all that relentless obsession and genius then later in his life went into germs, and it's a fascinating story. There have been many film attempts in the past to try to portray this man because of how interesting he is. Being able to focus on his younger years, where you see an initial descent into madness, it's not the aftermath. You see a man that's the first American billionaire, the first pioneer in the world of aviation, a huge presence in the golden era of Hollywood and making these monumental epic films, coupled with the fact that he has an intense fear of microscopic germs that eventually made him a madman. All that was such a dynamic combination of things that could have easily gone wrong, but it went beyond my expectations. I'm very proud of him. <laughs> She'll go faster. I wanted to go to Africa certainly way before the filming started because I mean this not only the African landscape to, to get accustomed to but the people there with this accent you know playing a man from South Africa from Rhodesia or modern day Zimbabwe it was completely alien to me and something that I was completely unused to so I had to kind of immerse myself in the culture there meet a lot of these real guys go out drinking with them and do some of these military exercises because I was pretty petrified before the film started as to how I would approach an accent that I couldn't even identify if somebody was speaking to me in it. Ah, well, you no longer accept conflict, Diamonds, huh? Wouldn't hurt to interest some other parties. Start a bidding war. Like one war's not enough for you, huh? <laughs> I missed you, Danny. I I've never been a part of a movie that had a sort of social message 
like this on such a grand scale and, I, and it needed to be the combination of both of those things to get people into the audience to have an entertaining film that had a great two central characters but also told us something about the world we live in you know, Frank I, uh, I look around at your other guys I mean, they're all murderers, right? Right? And I think, could I do murder? Hmm. And all I can answer myself is, what's the difference? Did you see a flash? What? Did somebody get hit? Let's see playback on it. Stay with them. Hello? Casey didn't see it, I executed him, Ed. You did what you had to do, and if you hadn't, he would be describing you down to your eyebrows to them right now. Well, I did it, all right? It's done, I killed him. He was always gonna get killed, no matter what he did. Besides, you milked him, and he was dry. Excuse me. What are you gonna do now? Are you gonna hit me to show me how much you love me? Don't worry, I can't be bothered. You're not worth the trouble it would take to hit you. You're not worth the powder it would take to blow you up. You are an empty, empty, hollow shell of a woman. I mean, what the hell are you doing in my house if you hate me so much? Why the hell are you married to me? What the hell are you doing carrying my child? I mean, why didn't you just get rid of it when you had the chance? Because listen to me, listen to me, I got news for you. I wish to God that you had. We've been looking for something to do together for a long period of time. We finally found the right piece of material, and, you know, it's just great to work with one of your best friends. It really is. She took them out one by one, held their heads under till they died. Then she brought them back inside and arranged them around the kitchen table. She ate a meal there before a neighbor dropped by. She starved herself when she first came here. She insisted the children weren't dead. I think there was an initial state of confusion, certainly, with everyone that read the screenplay. Chris Nolan is a visionary filmmaker. He's somebody who comes up with very complex narratives and is able to pull them off in, in a grand fashion. And he's got a great track record of doing that, but a lot of understanding what he wanted to accomplish cinematically meant sitting down with him in person. I spent two and a half months with the guy every other day trying to understand the rules of the dream world that he was creating, the possibilities of what was in that world, and trying to really create a character with a real emotional backbone and a therapeutic journey that he needs to go through within these stages of the subconscious. So I needed that one-on-one -on -one time with him to have more clarity. Well, dreams, they feel real while we're in them, right? It's only when we wake up that we realize something was actually strange. Ellen is a phenomenally talented young actress. I mean, she has a way of, of saying lines and everything that comes out of her mouth, you wholeheartedly believe, and that's, that's a real talent. She makes everything extremely conversational, and it, she has real heart behind what she does. There is an interaction with Marion Cotillard's character, who plays Maul, and she's a manifestation of my sort of nightmares. And it became this really sort of existential scene, and we had a really bizarre talks with one another because, you know, she was a reflection of myself in a way, and she was a manifestation of my own thoughts, yet she was her own unique character that did live in the real world, so she carried those attributes with her. So it became very surreal as to how to play some of these sequences, and I've never quite had that feeling on a set before in my life, or had those conversations with another actor. I'm going to jump and you're coming with me. No, I'm not. Now, now you listen to me. If you jump, you're not gonna wake up, remember? You're gonna die, now just, just step back inside. Come on, step back inside so we can talk about this. We've talked enough. 
it's hard to distinguish what the film is about, but I think that's a positive thing, and I think audiences want to be surprised, they want to be riveted, they want to have something unique, but I can't say it wasn't challenging, that's for sure, it was very, very challenging. The biggest challenge was something that was very uh, clearly defined in the screenplay for me was how do you understand his motivations and how that manifested itself into politics. And it was very intriguing to discover Dustin Lance Black's screenplay because the first time I kind of understood what motivated him. At a very young age, he was, you know, his mother wanted him to rise to great power in politics and carry on the Hoover name to great glory. And he was a young boy genius. and really organized modern forensics and really put a face on a federal system of police enforcement that to this day is incredibly intimidating. My politics aren't in line with his. <laughs> he had a very right-wing sort of Puritan view on how to protect democracy in our country at any means necessary, but I, I believe that he was a great patriot and I believe that he was there to protect our country at all costs. Uh, of course, he stayed in power for way too long, which was the great tragedy of his career. Fifty years and eight presidents, he should have been gone long ago by the time the civil rights movement was coming about and uh, you know our, our country was changing for the better. He went ahead and tried to politically attack Martin Luther King and take down that movement and label it as a communist uprising, which was absurd. You still fancy facial hair, Agent Stokes? The ladies appreciate it. Mm. And I suppose the ladies' opinions are more important than the bureaus? No, sir. Perhaps you are better suited for the police force than the Bureau of Investigations. I've been with the Department of the Bureau for seven years, Edgar. Almost as long as you. No. You were with the old Bureau seven years, and that Bureau is now gone, sir. The makeup and the prosthetic, it took away from some of the shooting time, and it was probably six hours every day. And it was very complicated to try to inhabit that older version of J. Edgar Hoover, and for all the other actors, too. But to be able to walk into a room and talk to, you know, Robert F. Kennedy as if he was a young political upstart who didn't know the first thing about uh, the state of the world or, or, or politics to begin with. I took a lot of inspiration from Clint, too. He helped me out a lot with it. He's a man that implicitly trusts his own instincts, um, and it's a pretty phenomenal thing to witness every single day. He. He has a, a very tight-knit crew of people that he's been working with for years, movie veterans, <laughs> so to speak. He sees what he sees in his little monitor, and he watches what's in front of him, and he either likes it or he doesn't. He either move on or he gives you direction right then and there. He doesn't have a lot of advisors, and you could tell. He's a man that likes to sort of plant his feet and speak the truth, and he expects you to do the same as an actor. He isn't afraid to get his hands dirty, that's for sure. And we did that whole sequence and he brought his stunt coordinator in that he'd been working with for, you know, four decades. They reenacted our fight scene for us and Army and I couldn't couldn't help but stand there and have a, a huge grin on our face as we were watching that. I wanted to work with Tarantino for sure, and that was a, a very interesting set to walk on. I mean, there hadn't been many films up until that time about uh, about slavery, certainly of that sort of scale. I've been a fan of Quentin's work for a long time, and I love the fact that he was recreating his own history in a deeply American context with these spaghetti western, Sergio Leone genre mixed into it, something only Quentin Tarantino can do. I heard you've been telling everybody that Mandingos ain't no damn good, ain't nothing nobody is selling is worth buying. I'm curious. What makes you such a Mandingo expert? I'm curious what makes you so curious. This was one of the most narcissistic, self-indulgent, racist, most despicable characters I've ever read in my entire life. What was really great about the ensemble that we had was everyone was so incredibly supportive of one another. I mean, I remember some of the earlier, earlier um, read-throughs that we had when we all sat down at a table with Jamie and Carrie and, and, and Christoph and Sam and myself and we were talking about our characters and the different aspects of them and the way these relationships would connect. And, you know, to hear Sam Jackson and Jamie Foxx say, look, you know, I know this is a troubling character. I know he is, it might be difficult to do, but if you don't go the distance with this guy and make him 
as despicable as possible, people aren't going to embrace that as the truth. They're going to think we're sugarcoating the subject matter. So in essence, the further you go with him, the more truth you're going to speak. Hey! Now lay your palm flat on that tabletop! If you lift those palms off that turtle shell tabletop, Mr. Pooch is going to let loose with both barrels that start off. We had a uh, bunch of little wine glasses around and I had to get their attention constantly because I knew that the gig was up and my hand sort of smashed on one of the real wine glasses and then the stem went into my hand. So the choice was I suppose to either go on and finish my speech or not and then I noticed that blood was pouring everywhere. Where were we? That was the fun part, is watching their reactions. <laughs> Honestly, because boom, it happened, and then I opened my hand, and then blood starts pouring everywhere. And I saw Jamie go, yeah, like oh, this. And Quentin, Quentin like, had his hand, and then he goes, <laughs> you brought a nigga to stay in the big house. Your daddy rolling over in this goddamn grave right now. Yeah. It's getting worse and worse. Shit is that? met Mr. Gatsby. No one's met him. They say he's third cousin to the Kaiser and second cousin to the devil. I'm afraid I haven't been a very good host on sport. You see... I'm Gatsby. You're taking on Fitzgerald, or taking on one of the greatest novels ever written, certainly what's maybe considered the greatest American novel. Possibly. I mean, I think so. I remember reading it in high school and I identified with it, but in a completely different way from when I picked it up again as an adult. And it was really one of the most existential novels I've, I've ever read. And it's one of those novels that you can keep investigating and keep trying to find answers to. And it really is a lot to do with the editing of that book that's so fascinating. We took a lot from Trimalchio, which was the unedited version of The Great Gatsby. And that's what I kept referring to back and forth because so much of Gatsby is mysterious and unanswered. And that's the beauty of that character. For me, it was about going back to Trimalchio to find Fitzgerald's original intent and motivation with Gatsby. What he was saying to Daisy when he would sometimes sound obscure in The Great Gatsby, Trimalchio was a lot more overt and a lot more spelled out. I knew it was a great mistake for a man like me to fall in love. I'm only 32, I might still be a great man if I could forget that I once lost Daisy, but my life, old sport, my life, my life has got to be like this. I was reluctant because I think that what's so powerful about this novel is everyone has their own interpretation of these characters and it's such a voyeuristic novel the way Fitzgerald writes these scenes you feel like you're in the room with these people. Gatsby looked in that moment as if he had killed a man. attempted this like a theater production. The last plaza sequence, which is uh, 10 minutes long in the movie, which is the final climax of, of the big fight at the end, we rehearsed that like a theater company for weeks and weeks and endlessly tr tried to dissect Fitzgerald's words and went into that room for two weeks and locked ourselves away. Baz is a bit of a Gatsby himself in a lot of ways, you know, I keep saying that. As a very young man, he envisioned his life a certain way and he wanted to create great art and in, in his unique style and he's done that and I remember him bringing this novel to me and, and he had such a great enthusiasm and passion for putting this up on screen. The mere fact that I've known him for almost 20 years, I've known Toby for 25 years, I thought it would be a great partnership to take on this challenge and, and it was a really rewarding one. Jay, you can't repeat the past. Can't repeat the past? No. Why, of course you can. Of course you can.
there's been really two projects in my life that I really pushed as hard as I can to make happen and get greenlit. And that one was The Aviator and this was the other one. The real question is this, was all this legal? Absolutely fucking not. But we were making more money than we knew what to do with. It was a seven year process. We optioned the book and I think Jordan himself kind of liked the idea of Marty and I doing the movie so we got the rights to it. It was kind of a, a sought after novel and we had a screenplay pretty soon afterwards with Terry Winter that blew me away with these incredible speeches and this insane debaucherous hedonistic world that he created. Let me tell you something. There is no nobility in poverty. I have been a rich man and I have been a poor man and I choose rich every fucking time. He captured all the best stuff from the book and we were prepared to do it at one point, very early on, and I remember we got a certain budget that was really, really low-balled for the kind of epic nature of what this movie needed to be. It needed to be opulent and it needed to be all about this guy's wealth and decadence and Marty felt the budget wasn't right, but more so than that, as he said to me many times, he's like, look, I'm, I'm seven years old and at this point, I don't want to have resistance in making the movies that I want. And if I'm going to do a film and I'm going to put these people and this culture up on screen, I'm, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. And so he kind of dropped out of doing it because he felt a certain resistance from the studio about the nature of how deplorable and disgusting these characters are at times up on screen. And it kind of fell through, at which point the sort of industry pushes things along and another director got attached and another director, but I could never say yes to it. And I don't know what it was, but I just said, there's nobody that's going to capture the essence of these people and give the actors enough time to play and explore the darker nature and the comedic element of these characters except for Marty. He has to do this so I waited and waited and waited and waited and then seven years down the line I found financing from people that are outside of the industry that said not only do we want you to do this movie, but we want you to really go for it, because that's the truth of this world. And I came back to Marty and said, we're not going to get this opportunity very often, and almost never. I can't move on to the more FBI. Jordan, are you fucking high? <laughs> Jordan, do me a favor, stay where you are. Don't get behind the wheel of the car. I'm going to send someone to pick you up. Jordan, Jordan. After 15 years in storage, the lemons had developed a delayed fuse. It took 90 minutes for these little fuckers to kick in, but once they did, pow! When I was talking with Marty about this movie, I said, look, it's got to feel to me how the segment in Goodfellas felt with Ray Liotta with the cocaine and marinara sauce with the helicopters. The whole movie should have that energy. So we knew that this quaalude sequence, which was a combination of many scenes that we fused Mark. together to add more tension Mark. to, had to, even, had to even up the ante of that. And so that was the, the beauty of having financiers and people that really encourage us. It's so fun to play a character that has absolutely no moral compass. Your only question every day is what is good for me? Actors have said many times before, it's, it's, it's so fun to play bad, but it's been so fun to play a character like this that just is a vacuum cleaner of consumption. He just never questions his impulses. I'd never been able to actually play a character where I could call them on the phone. It was a revelation, kind of. He took me through every scene and gave me the beat by beat of his motivation, where his head was at. It was a whole different dynamic to making a movie and incredibly beneficial. We didn't know quite what we were gonna do. We didn't say we're making a comedy. We didn't say we're gonna push the comedic element of it. It was just kind of the wildness of Jordan's life and his book. Take this company into the fucking stratosphere! We really got to make a film like they used to make in the 70s. They, I mean, it's true. I mean, this was uh, the director's vision. This is back to the era for Heaven's Gate or whatever when directors really had the power to do whatever they wanted on a large scale like this. So that I'm really, really proud of. I'm really proud because I don't see many, many, many films like this getting made nowadays. It's a big gamble. It was a big gamble, this movie. The whole film was in order of Hugh Glass's life. A man that loses everything and has this initial journey of revenge to confront the person that has stripped him of his entire life. 
The script was very linear, very simple. That was the great thing about the screenplay. We knew that that was a great model for something much more poetic or existential. I think Alejandro had it stuck in his mind. He couldn't really articulate, but he said, the answers are gonna be there when we're on location, when we start to live these people's lives. And that's why he wanted to shoot it in order as much as possible, because so much of what the narrative was was dictated by us being there, having those experiences, having the interactions with uh, the Native Americans and the whole ending changed. The whole film sort of changed and took new forms and it was in a grand experimentation that was very planned out in the beginning, but he wanted to find the poetry and meaning while we were in the elements. Ultimately, everything that we did in the film dictated the last outcome. I'd love to work with him again. I'd love to do a film in the wilderness again, but this particular experience was a pretty memorable, profound, difficult one. So there's a lot of things that I do in this movie, whether it be sleeping in an animal carcass or falling off of cliffs or going down frozen ro roaring rapids or fighting with Tom Hardy or a bear. It was nine months of this. I remember there was a day where I had to come out of a frozen river and the bear fur, I had to walk with it up a hill. And when you have a bear fur on that is submerged in water, it weighs about 120 pounds and then you're trying to climb up a hill and your body's sort of slowly freezing. I don't know how these men did it. I mean, I had to do it for five minutes and I was in absolute agony. But these men lived in these conditions. That's what I watch this movie and I leave the theater. I'm like, oh my God, people actually live like this. I mean, about Siberia. How, how do people exactly. survive in these elements? The human resilience and its ability to adapt is incredibly profound and powerful. That's what has made us such a dominant species. But being from an urban environment, never having to endure those conditions was pretty eye-opening. I ain't afraid to die anymore. I've done it already. The way this film was shot was completely unique. We rehearsed all day long. It was like a piece of theater every single day. We rehearsed from morning to night and orchestrated with Chivo, who's one of the best cinematographers of all time, exactly how they wanted the camera to move in coordination with the actors, the entire background. And then we had this one hour of magic light and we scrambled to get it. So it caused, it was a very intense experience for all departments, all actors. Every day was like the entire crew working as a Swiss watch with all these different components in place, all the extras, the set pieces, the, the wardrobe, the makeup, all these different actors working in exact unison to accomplish a specific shot within a one hour time frame. So it was a huge amount of tension every single day. But that was the beauty of it. We were all in it together, trying something completely unique, trying something different. And there was an enthusiasm and camaraderie to that. Mark Musley, if you like, Take away the stuff from real quick and easy. Whenever it has to know that you give up, I do that. All you gotta do is blink if you want me to do that. Save your boy and blink. These are the types of movies that people made in the silent era of filmmaking when they didn't have a lot of the tricks that we now have in the movie making process. I mean, granted, there's small amounts of CGI in this movie, but everything that you kind of see is actors really doing these things really in the elements as cinema is going more towards the small screen and television. And there's so much great television right now. We need films like this that aren't just CGI spectacle, superhero films, but films where you embrace something very unique in the vision of an incredibly masterful, talented director. And that's what Alejandro is doing here. He's using cinema on a grand scale and being very transformative about it. I don't think there's been any film ever, ever made like this.
always been fascinated by this world that we live in and how destructive we are to it. As soon as I really became an actor, that's been a parallel passion of mine is trying to bring attention to some incredibly important issues. I think that so little goes to protecting our planet. When you think, think of all of philanthropy, only 2% of philanthropy and, and giving goes towards the biggest life-sustaining force that we have, and that's our planet. And we're systematically polluting it. We're chopping down rainforests, destroying coral reef systems, animals, uh, very unique creatures that have taken hundreds of millions of years to evolve are becoming extinct, and it's pretty horrific what we're doing. So I've devoted a lot of time away from acting to not only try to bring attention to it, to, but to bring much needed funding to a lot of these issues. I feel like I can make a good contribution to it, but I, more than anything, I would really love to get a lot of the wealthiest people on earth to focus on these issues because it's, it's becoming pretty dire. We are all here to keep the pressure on our politicians and our corporations to recognize the drastic implications of global warming. The word warming sounds almost inviting, that in a world 20 years from now we will all be living in a tropical paradise where the extent of our problems will be pondering which SPF sunscreen to use. But don't be fooled by semantics. Thousands of climate scientists agree that global warming is not only the most threatening environmental problem but one of the greatest challenges facing all of humanity. This moment is more important than ever. We must empower leaders who not only believe in climate change but are willing to do something about it. The scientific consensus is in and the argument is now over. If you do not believe in climate change, you do not believe in facts or in science or empirical truths and therefore, in my humble opinion, should not be allowed to hold public office. Before the Flood has been my three-year journey exploring the subject of climate change. While making the film, we traveled around the world to learn more about the effects of climate change on our planet and all of us. And I had the opportunity to speak to scientists, world leaders, and activists on the urgency of this issue. Climate change is an issue that affects all of us. So please tune in and spread the word. Thank you very much. Not everyone can necessarily get solar panels. Not everyone's going to drive a, a hybrid car. I think the point is vote with your dollar. Endorse, uh, endorse green technology in, in every way you possibly can. And, and also vote. Vote for leaders that are, that are going to implement this into our daily lives so we don't need to think about it anymore. That would be a great world. I always wanted to work with Leo, a young man who I've always admired, who one day was kind enough, just based on my calling his agent, to send my daughter, his biggest fan, an autographed picture. And, you know, and that, that, that meant a lot to, in, in my family and made me a hero amongst my kids. And I got DiCaprio's signature on a picture for my daughter, who was at the time about seven years old. Leo likes to watch himself on the monitor between takes. He likes to watch his playbacks. He's more critical of himself than, than even I am. And I remember every time we finished a series of takes, maybe seven, eight takes, I'd be really happy. I'd say, okay, let's move on. And Leo would say, just one more for the Gipper. And then what Leo would do is he'd do the last take and he'd throw all caution to the wind with the way he would approach this take that was for the Gipper, meaning I was free to ignore it, to laugh at it, to say, Leo, you're over the top. We'll never use that in a movie. And 80% of the time, those takes where he felt he was free, under no pressure to perform anymore because he was satisfied with what he had done, and very often that's the take that would wind up in the movie. He's wonderful. He's a great friend. He's a lot of fun. He's a sweet guy. He's just a really normal guy. He he just like has his group of dudes and he's all like all his boys and he's always with his friends and he's super into the environment. Not many people realize that but he has this charity that he works really really hard for and invests like a lot of time into it and no one gives him credit for that which I think is a real shame. And he's not just doing that you know so a celebrity can have a charity, he like seriously knows everything about every like plant and animal that's ever been endangered and, and, and extinct and like I'm talking everything. He's a really funny guy. Everyone's so surprised by his physical comedy, but if you knew him in person, he's actually very funny, and, and physical comedy is kind of something that is a part of his personality. He's so committed. Like, within a scene, you know, you can play a scene at level one or at 11, and he's always he's pushing for the edge. You know, he's not protecting himself in any way. You know, sometimes you will, you'll kind of put the reins on, but he's, he's literally throwing himself out there, and he goes all the way, and it's really impressive. 
as wonderful a leading man as Leo is, and you know, leading men don't grow on trees. It's kind of a big deal to be a good leading man. He's also a, a terrific character actor. I don't think he ever thinks in terms of I'm playing the good guy, I'm playing the bad guy. His characterization is kind of awesome, and he's brought something to the character that I didn't see on the page, and that's made everybody else kind of step up to another place also. Leonardo walked in, and he was like, y'all just think I'm the good-looking dude to have all the models? Watch what's about to happen, and they said action, and we saw this dude elevate his game to a place to where you couldn't sleep at night. If you're doing a scene with him, you gotta wake up. You know, I worked with Leo DiCaprio from Gangs of New York, which is uh, 2002, I think, to The Aviator and, and also The Departed. They were all intense experiences, but Gangs was a particularly complex one. The playing of Howard Hughes uh, as an actor, I thought he really was able to hit certain levels that I was very pleased with, and so was he. And then the nature, the emotional nature of what developed in Departed. What he had was uh, the ability to uh, explore every aspect of it. I mean, just go. You know, and I'd be able to reign as much as possible, him and the rest together, try to keep everybody in the same frame. But no, it was really a matter of not being afraid to go to places that normally uh, other actors wouldn't do. That, that was the thing, and it to be, you know, sort of push it, to keep pushing. Leonardo, when I first worked with him, he was a very gifted young man. Time has gone on, he's a friend. His parents are, are very good friends of mine, I adore them. Now he's a man in full command of his life and his powers. He's really mature and deep thinking, and he has, the only thing that hasn't changed in all the time I've known him, and I suppose it's 20 years now, he has always been singularly passionate about acting and about the planet on which we live. Right. And I think that his credibility and his genuineness and his decency, and actually the fact that he's so damn lovely, mm -hmm. wrapped up in that package, has mean he's become a good, an easy target to malign. Because you think no one can have all that and actually be like a good guy. <laughs> the sad truth is, he is. I mean, he is just lovely. I was completely amazed in the audition that Leonardo DiCaprio was playing two parts, like sitting next to me on the sofa playing Gatsby and then jumping up to the other side of the room and playing Tom behind the camera. It was so charming and lovely. And he was amazing on set. He's so generous. I've never seen anything like how committed he is to everybody else and not just himself. He does the most amazing performance and it's caught on film and then the camera turns around onto the other actor and he gives exactly the same level of intensity for that person to help them. I have great affection for Leo, we're very good friends, one of my best friends and happens to be a great actor. And I loved watching his process and participating in his process with him. He is really a diligent detective. He loves looking through the source material and finding every kernel of truth that he can and building a very uh, layered, rich character. The relationship we have, the trust we have for each other is tremendous, so we have a real ease of communication in talking about scenes, the material. We both take our jobs very seriously and we have a lot of fun too. He's a brilliant actor. I do feel so grateful for that friendship, and it is honestly, it is like family, you know. It's, it's one of those rare Hollywood friendships. You know, I just feel very, very blessed. I suppose at some point I might retire, but I've always looked at this as the greatest gift that anyone's ever given me. I feel like I won the lotto, so I'm gonna keep going as long as they'll have me. si bon de partir n'importe où bras dessus bras dessous en chantant des chansons c'est si bon de se dire des mots doux de petits rien dis-tu mais qui ont dit en langue en voyant notre mineur Ravieux. Les passants dans la rue nous envient. C'est si bon de guetter dans ses yeux une esprit merveilleux qui donnait la frisson. C'est si bon ces petites sensations. Ça vaut mieux que million. C'est tellement, tellement bon. bon c'est bon. Mmh, c'est bon. bon, bon. Voilà, c'est bon. bon, bon. Les passants dans la rue. Bon, bon. Bras dessus, bras dessus. Bon, 
en chantant des chansons. Quel espoir merveilleux. Mmh, C'est bon.